All right, if you have your Bibles, if you would, turn to John chapter 14. As you're turning, the children's choir was awesome, and the whole time I'm sitting there watching the children's choir, I'm thinking about the fact that some of the ones who are leading us in worship, I remember when they were in the children's choir. Uh, that's how long I've been here. And so you are seeing your future worship leaders down there. It's great to be here. How many of y'all grew up Baptist? Let me just get a feel. I know most of our, a lot of our people are not. So if you grew up Baptist, you were kind of the same tribe I was. We didn't talk a lot about the Holy Spirit growing up. In fact, how many of y'all grew up in a church where you sing the first, second, and last stanza of the, of the songs? You never sang the third verse. Did you ever know why you didn't sing the third verse? Because a lot of times hymn writers would do it this way. The first verse is about the Father. The second verse is about the Son. The third verse is about the Spirit. And the last verse is about the church. So we just kept that third verse out. We didn't want to deal with it. Because you start talking about the Spirit, man, next thing you know, they're going to bring snakes into the church, right? Or, or you know, somebody's going to hit you in the head and expect you to fall out and shake for a little while. I mean, it, it was just kind of weird stuff when you talked about the Holy Spirit. So we just didn't talk about the Holy Spirit much at all. And there was a lot of confusion about the Holy Spirit. And the truth is, I think that that is just Satan's ploy. Because if he can keep us from talking about the Spirit, if he can have confusion about the Spirit, then we will never understand the Holy Spirit's role in our life and drawing us to God, transforming us as Christians, giving us power to live for Christ, and, and, and um, really working in our lives. And so for the next four weeks, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit and what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit. And my hope is that as we do that, that um, we will discover the Holy Spirit's role in our lives, the power that comes through that and the things that we're going to talk about in the next four weeks, and maybe even as a church, to look a little bit more like the church in Acts. So what we're going to do today is simple. We're going to lay some groundwork and then um, talk about four things quickly that the Holy Spirit does in us. Next week, Marcy will pick that up, and, and we're going to be looking at three really specific aspects of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. So in your notes, the first thing we need to understand about the Holy Spirit is He is God. He is God. And we have a God who's a triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And you would say, well, of course he's God, but, but understand this. I think most of us, when we think about God the Father, an image pops up in our head. I think we have at least some kind of concept when we think about creator God, the God of the Old Testament. And, and I think we have this image about who he is and how he interacted with the people and, and talking to Moses. And so I think we, we have that. Then you talk about God the Son that we see in the Gospels, and, and we all have a picture of that. He looks a lot like Jim Caviezel, right? And, and so we've got this picture in our head of what Jesus looks like and we, what he did. And, and so we have a pretty good picture of God the Son uh, who is instrumental in our redemption. But I think when I say God the Spirit, that, that many times we come up kind of blank and and really don't know how to think about that. And so, you know, so what we need to understand is the Bible clearly talks about the fact that God the Spirit is the part of a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So what I really need to do to you is, is explain the Trinity. Yeah, ain't no way that's going to happen, all right? <laughs> We, we can't fully understand and comprehend the, the, the Trinity. Uh, I mean, I've had people say, well, the Trinity is sort of like H2O. You put it in a you know, put it in the freezer, it's ice. You put it on the stove, it's steam. You, you leave it out, it's water. Well, maybe, but that's, that really explains H2O. That doesn't explain the Trinity. You know, I thought about this, too. I said, you know, there was a time when my father was my father, my boss, and my baseball coach. One man, three different roles in my life. But that really comes very short of explaining who the, the Trinity is. So how do I explain the Trinity? I don't. And you know what? I'm okay with that. That's why he's God. Right? It, that's why he's God. Look, there are things we just will never be able to explain. We'll never know until we get to heaven. 
And if you have trouble with that, just, just wrap your head around this one, you know, and think about it this afternoon. When you get the answer, let me know, all right? How could God always have existed? He, he, was, he wasn't created. He's been forever. We can't comprehend that with our finite minds. We really can't wrap our heads around that you're going to live eternally. You're never going to die. And, and, and that the universe, there's no end to the, I mean, how do you, you, there are things we can't understand. And the Trinity is one of those things. It's beyond our comprehension. But the, whole, the Holy Spirit is as much God as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. In fact, somebody, as we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks, somebody said this, well, in the Old Testament, God the Father was for us. In the Gospels, God as Jesus was with us. In Acts through Jude, God the Holy Spirit is in us. And then in Re Revelation, we'll be with God. That helps us a little bit to understand their roles. Somebody said, well, God the Father has no flesh, God the Son came in flesh, and God the Holy Spirit lives in our flesh. Again, to give us a little bit more understanding. So let's look at our verse, John 14, 16 through 17. And here's what Jesus says. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. Here's what Jesus has told his apostles. It's good that I'm going to heaven, because when I go, I'm going to ask the Father, and he's going to give you some, another one, a counselor, to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. Now, what's interesting about this verse is whenever he says he will give you another, there are two, two Greek words for the word another. One means in addition to. So let's say I'm out with Zach and somebody says, oh, is he your son? I say, yes. And they go, is he your only child? And I would say, no, I have another son. So it's an addition to. That's not the word that's used here. The other word, elos, is a word that means identical to. So if I'm at a restaurant and I order mango sweet tea, can I get an amen? All right. And I finish my mango sweet tea and, I, and the, the waitress comes by and says, would you like another? What do I expect? I don't expect her to bring me a blackberry tea or a peach tea. I want another. It's an identical to mango sweet tea. That's the word Jesus used here. So here's what Jesus just said. The father is going to send you another one just like me. Well, how can that be? Because they're both God. God's going to, get, the Father is going to send God to be with you in the person of the Holy Spirit. Second thing we need to know is that the Holy Spirit is a person and he's personable. You know, sometimes we get confused because we call him the Holy Spirit or, or old school, man, King James, we call him the Holy Ghost, right? And, and we get kind of confused about that. The, the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person, Let's go back to that verse again that we had uh, up there. Notice what he says. Uh, the Father, he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He, talking about the Spirit, is the Spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't know him or, or uh, because it doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him, talking about a person, that the Holy Spirit is a person and he's personable. He interacts with you. Notice what Jesus says. You know him because he's been working uh, through me and he's been working through you as I've been here with you. And there's going to be a day where he's going to come and he's going to be in you. And when I hear that, here's what I know. Not everybody in this room knows him. And there's two primary reasons why you don't know him. The first would be that you've never really surrendered your will to God and trusted God as your Lord and Savior. The only way you will ever know the Spirit in your life is if you're saved, if you've given your life to Christ, and you're truly following him. And we're going to look at that in a little bit more in just a minute. So, so for some, the reason you don't know him is because you've never really trusted in God. 
But there are others, and, I, and I'm afraid it's a larger number than I'd like for it to be in our church, who, who you're a Christian and the Holy Spirit lives in you, but you still don't know him because you've never learned how to hear his voice. You've never learned how to identify his presence in your life. He's there, but you couldn't say that you really know him. And so he's a personable God, and that, that during this series, we want you to get to know him in a real and personal way. And then the last kind of foundational truth is that he's in every believer, that, that he dwells within you. You know, Christmas is just a few weeks away. I went to Disney yesterday, and Christmas is already at Disney, right? I mean, it's just full-out Christmas at Disney now. But it's not, not that many weeks away. And at Christmas time, when we talk about Jesus coming to earth, we say that he is Christ Emmanuel. Emmanuel means that God with us, that he came and he walked this earth with us. And so he's God Emmanuel. And, and we use that so much in the context of Jesus. But where is Jesus today? He's in heaven at the right hand of the Father. But the Holy Spirit is just as much Emmanuel as God, as Jesus is. The Holy Spirit is now Emmanuel, God within us, and he dwells within us. And he's in the lives of everyone who truly believes in God. And so what does it mean for the Holy Spirit to be in us and what happens because of that? That's what we want to look at over the next four weeks. So today, let's look at four things, four benefits, four truths about the Holy Spirit, the fact that he is in you. First of all, in your notes, he is your deposit. He is your deposit. Let me explain what we mean by that. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Here's what Paul says. In him also, when you heard the word of, of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you also believed, you were sealed in him. Who's him? With the promised Holy Spirit. Here's what, Jesus, here's what Paul is saying. The moment you believed in God, the Holy Spirit came and dwelt within you. Look, there, there are some people who teach, no, there's got to be the second blessing or this baptism or all of these things. No, the, the Bible's very clear. The moment you receive Christ, the Holy Spirit comes within you. Well, then why don't I feel him? And well, why isn't things happening? Well, here's the deal. The question is not really whether I have the Holy Spirit. The question is, does the Holy Spirit have me? That's good enough for a repeat, all right? So let me just tell you, the question is not, do I have the Holy Spirit? If I've trusted in God, I have the Holy Spirit. The real question is, does the Holy Spirit have me? Have I surrendered my will so that the Holy Spirit can work in my life? And then he goes on to say, he is the down payment of our inheritance. I love that when Paul says that. He is the down payment of our inheritance, if you're my age, or, or you can remember back when stores had layaway plans. In fact, they're bringing them back now, which is kind of interesting. Layaway plans. So how does that work? Well, I go find something I want. I can't pay fully for it. So instead of getting out the plastic demon, what I do is I bring it to customer service. I put some money down, and I say, I am buying this. And the store recognizes that that's mine. They can't sell it to anybody else because I put a deposit down on it. It's mine. And when I come and make the last payment, now I get to take it home and enjoy the benefits of it. Here's what, here's what Paul say, is saying here. It's the Holy Spirit who is the down payment in your life that you're God's. That God owns you. I mean, that you're a child of God. That's it's the Holy Spirit that affirms that. And it's just a down payment because we will not receive the full benefits of salvation until we get to heaven. But if that's the truth, then the question is, do I know the Holy Spirit dwells within me? It's one of the most important questions we can ever ask. How do you know if you're a Christian? How do you know you're, that your sins are forgiven? How do you know you're going to heaven when you die? It's the Holy Spirit. You see, nowhere in the Bible does it say that church membership is your proof of salvation, even though every believer ought to be involved in a life-giving church. 
The Bible doesn't teach that baptism is a part of your salvation, even though every, ba every Christian should be baptized as a public profession of faith. The Bible even tells us that, um, that believing in God is not even enough to be a Christian. Satan and all his demons believe in God. The Bible says very clearly that to be a Christian means that we surrender our lives to him. And when that happens, the Holy Spirit comes within us, and it's the Holy Spirit that confirms our salvation. It's only the work of the Holy Spirit that lets me know that I'm saved, my sins are forgiven, I'm going to heaven when I die, I have a power here on earth. It is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's so important for us to know and identify the Spirit in our lives. In fact, Jesus one day said this. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Well, how do you hear the voice of Jesus? The answer is that through the Holy Spirit. In fact, we're going to look at a verse in just a few minutes where Jesus says very clearly, when the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within you, he doesn't even speak on his own. He speaks what I reveal to him. That how do we hear the voice of the shepherd? It's through the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And so it would be very important for me to be able to hear and know and identify the, the voice of the Holy Spirit in my life because that's the confirmation of my salvation. The second thing that the Holy Spirit is, he's your comforter. He's your comforter. Where do you go when you're anxious, worried, pressed, when life crushes in on you? Where do you go for comfort? Paul, writing in 2 Corinthians 1, if you could go back to verse 3, he's, man, he's just praising God for his amazing presence in the midst of comforting, in the midst of, of suffering, I mean. And in verse 3, Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort. And then look at what he says. And he comforts us in all of our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are, any, are, who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. What is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the one who brings comfort in our lives. You already heard it on stage today. Troy talked about it. We all go through stuff. Where do you go when life seems overwhelming? What do you do when it seems to be crushing in? When, when you've gotten some news, whenever everything just seems, everybody tries to find comfort someplace. Some people look for comfort in a, in a bottle or in drugs. Some people look for comfort in food. In fact, we haven't even call it comfort food. Some people look for comfort and just escaping and watching TV and blocking the world out. Some just get depressed and, and angry. And all of those things will just continue. Man, they may anesthetize it for just a little while, but they're all going to leave you empty. And it's only through the Holy Spirit that we find true comfort. Because what the Holy Spirit does is he brings truth into our lives. So one time Paul is going through this situation and, and Paul prays three times, God, would you remove this from my life? It's, it, God, I, just please remove it from my life. Three seasons of prayer. And finally, Paul says, and here's what happened. God didn't take the situation from me. All he did is he reminded me that his grace is sufficient to see me through it. That was the work of the Holy Spirit in Paul's life. We don't know exactly what that was he was going through, and we don't even know all that the Holy Spirit revealed to him. But my guess is it may have been something like this. Hey, Paul, I know you're going through this. I'm there with you. And, and Paul, let me just remind you, there's going to be a day when that's no longer there, that this life is just a mist, it's just a vapor, it's just going to happen, but it's, I'm going to be there for you. And, and it's in truth that the Holy Spirit speaks to us and comforts us. You're not alone. I'm with you. My grace is sufficient. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And the Holy Spirit will speak to you and bring incredible comfort into your lives. 
In John chapter 14, 15, and 16, over and over, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit. And in the translation we're using, it uses the word counselor, that he is our counselor. But the Greek word there is parakletos, and it, it can be translated one of three ways. It can be translated counselor, comforter, or helper. And they're all valid. Some of your translations even say comforter and not counselor or helper. And so what Jesus is saying, man, it's good for me to go to the Father because when I do, he's going to send you another, another one just like me, who's going to dwell within you. And one of the things he's going to do is he's going to bring comfort to you. He's going to be your helper, your parakletos. He's going to be your counselor. That's why we can be commanded to be anxious about nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication, make your request known to God, and God will give you what? The peace that passes understanding. Where does that peace come from? It comes from the counselor, the comforter. It comes from the helper. It comes from the Holy Spirit who is active in our lives. And, but notice in, the, in this verse, we just... Paul says, now we've received this comfort from God through the Holy Spirit, but this verse also gives us a mission. Now it's your job to, to bring comfort to others with the comfort you've just received. How do you do that? Well, you do that like Troy did this morning, praying with somebody who is going through a storm right now. It's in the context, context of relationships that we as Christians are used by God to bring comfort to each other. But it's also to bring comfort to the world and say that, that there's a God who will forgive you of your sins, a God who loves you more than you can imagine, and he wants to be a part of your life. And, and so we're really given a ministry through that verse also. The Holy Spirit's your deposit. He's your comforter. And thirdly, he's your guide. He's your guide. He, he leads you in all truth. Look at what it says in John 16, 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak his own. Again, remember, Jesus is going to speak through him to us, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. The Holy Spirit is our guide. And how does that work? How does he reveal that truth? Well, you go back to kind of experiencing God principles. He reveals truth to us as we spend time in Scripture. You see, as I'm reading the scriptures, my first thing before I read, I ought to say, Lord, speak to me today. And the Holy Spirit who knows everything I'm going through, the Holy Spirit who inspired the scripture, then takes those words and ministers to me and, and leads me and, and guides me through his word. The Holy Spirit leads us through the word. He leads us through prayer. I used to, man, used to years ago struggle. How does, how does he lead through prayer? And kind of had an idea, didn't. And then I learned really a secret in my prayer life. And it's not necessarily for everybody. For my prayer life, here's what I do. I make all my requests at night. And in the morning, I just shut up and listen. So at night, I go through my whole list. People I'm praying for, for their salvation. Lord, reveal things I shouldn't have done or said today. Things I need to do. All of those things. At night... And when I wake up in the morning, I just say, Lord, I need to hear from you. And let me tell you, there are some mornings where God speaks so clearly that I, when I get up, I have to go do something because I know what he's told me to do. There are other mornings, crickets. <laughs> I don't hear anything. Okay? Because if I could, I mean, that's where we, why we walk by faith. But most mornings, I, I really hear the, the Spirit's voice. Here lately, there's been one thing over and over, and it has to do with me and some things he wants to do in my life, and, and I, I have to listen to that, but that gives me direction. The Holy Spirit works through circumstances. He'll point you to something and say, do you see that? Here's how God's working, or here's what he wants to do. He will lead you through church as you come and you worship, you hear the message, you go to small group, uh, and he actually leads you through others, and so the Holy Spirit is the one who guides us and shows us God's will for our lives. Thirdly, I mean, lastly, he's your power. The Holy Spirit is the power in your life for transformation. If you struggle with, with a, uh, you know, a stronghold in your life, you will never overcome that in the flesh. It's only through the Spirit you're going to live victoriously. And look at this verse in Acts 1.8. 
but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. This word power here in the Greek is the word dunamis. And it's where we get the word dynamite. You, you're going to get an incredible power when the Holy Spirit enters into your life to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Usually when I preach this, I preach about the mission he's given. But, but don't miss the first part. He told his apostles, go to Jerusalem and wait for the, for the gift that my Father's going to give you. Ten days later, they're in a prayer meeting in an upper room. The Holy Spirit comes down and now enters into their lives. They spill out in the street preaching. Peter preaches at Pentecost. 3,000 people get saved that day. And those 11 apostles who are left, who ran when, Jesus, when they came to arrest Jesus, now have a boldness like they've never seen, so much so that, that the authorities say, look, these are just uneducated, unschooled men. How in the world are they able to do what they're able to do? It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. And here's what Scripture says. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead is a power that lives within you if you have the Spirit within you. And God wants to do amazing things in your life and through your life. So why wouldn't we want the Spirit and all that God has for us? Why would we settle for less? Well, one, maybe because we love sin more than we love God. But another reason is because we've never really understood who lives in us and the power that's available through him. And so today, we want to begin a four-week journey. And for some of you today, that journey can begin by just surrendering your life to Christ and inviting the Holy Spirit in. For others, maybe it's that journey that, that Lord, help me to hear your voice and know you're working in my life. Here's one for a lot of us. Lord, help me to be obedient to what you've already talked to me about. Because here's what I've come to understand. Until I'm obedient, a lot of times all the Spirit does is keep bringing that thing up. Well, God, here's what I need you to do. Well, Chuck, what about that? Let's get back to that. And maybe what we need is a little obedience. Maybe you came in here and you're carrying a load, and quite honestly, this message wasn't even about that, but you just, you're just, It's heavy, and you need to pray with somebody. We're going to stand. We're going to worship. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit into into this service. and He's already here, but just acknowledge that. And I'm going to ask some of our deacons and elders if they would come forward. They're going to be here to pray with you. Maybe you just want to come to the altar and pray. But we want to respond to the Holy Spirit as he leads us during this time. Let's all stand. Let me pray, and we're going to worship together. Father God, we thank you that you're here in our midst. We thank you you're in every believer. Lord, help us to be obedient to all you call us to do. I pray if there's one here today who's never given their lives to you, that God, today would be that day, and they would come and take the hand of one of our deacons, their wives, and and Lord, that they would just surrender to you. I pray that God, if there are things in our lives we're holding back, maybe we want to use these steps as an altar. However you lead us today, God, help us to respond as we worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.